Hi, my friends. Professor Anthony Swite here from BYU Church History and Doctrine. Welcome to another great episode of the Why Religion Podcast. Have you ever seen or approached a piece of visual art in a museum or in a book and looked at it and thought, I just don't really get it? Well, don't worry. I have too. When that happens, it is because sometimes we might be approaching the art in only one way. Perhaps we are looking at the piece representationally, like, in other words, how realistic is this painting? And if that's the only lens that we've ever really known to analyze a piece of art, suddenly we're a bit stymied and we move away from it when it doesn't fit that. But there is more than one way to look at and analyze art. For example, you can look at it didactically. What's it teaching? You can look at it emotionally. What's it leading me to feel? Compositionally, how are the colors and objects in the image arranged? Curiously, what questions is this pursuing or causing me to ask? Symbolically, what indirectly is being represented in this piece? Suddenly, with just a few more lenses available, you can approach a piece of art like a classic Rothko, for example, and you can begin to appreciate it and know how to look at it and analyze it more. Well, sometimes the same phenomenon can happen with scripture, including great masterpieces like the Book of Mormon. If we only approach it one way, we can miss the very depth its pages provide. People often approach the Book of Mormon spiritually, seeking for inspiration and religious application in their personal lives, and apologetically, to know and defend its truthfulness. Those are both useful and excellent and needful ways to approach the text. But they're not the only ways. Like Grant Hardy showed us in his instant classic book, Understanding the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon can also be approached narratively, trying to understand the Book of Mormon's structure and purpose through its principal narrators like Nephi and Mormon. And that's not all. The Book of Mormon can also be studied literarily, theologically, historically, intertextuality, eisegetically, exegetically, politically, and socially, just to name a few. In other words, there's a lot of ways the text can and should be explored. This is what Dr. Joseph Spencer and many of his colleagues do with the Book of Mormon, and they have recently published a new book on it called Book of Mormon Studies, An Introduction and Guide. When we're doing only apologetics, it can feel like we've got a car in the garage, it's a Ferrari or something, right? And yet what we do is go out into the garage and we turn it on and go, does it run? Yeah, it runs. We turn it back off and then go back in the house. Whereas doing something like theology, at least for my money, right, I'm a theologian, uh, is uh, taking the opportunity to turn the car on and then take it out and drive around, see what the Book of Mormon can do. In today's episode, Professor Spencer takes us into the world and current state of Book of Mormon studies to help orient those who want to learn more about approaches and emerging scholarship in this academic field of Book of Mormon studies. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Professor Joseph Spencer recently sat down with Why Religion's Casey Griffith to discuss his and his co-author's recent book publication, Introducing Readers to Book of Mormon Studies. In part one, he will take us into why he and his colleagues wrote this book providing an overview of the book and its content, including the historical development of Book of Mormon studies and different ways the Book of Mormon is studied. He will also share with us how Book of Mormon scholars approach common obstacles, what new questions are on the table today that they're looking at, and why its text is richly relevant to modern questions related to things such as gender, race, and violence. Oh, 
All right. Uh, Joe, thanks for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, we're talking about your new volume, uh, Book of Mormon Studies and Introduction and Guide. This is authored, co-authored with Daniel Becerra and Amy Easton Flake and Nick Frederick. Uh, and I think um, a lot of people right off the bat would ask the question, do we need a guide to study the Book of Mormon? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. So tell us what was the motivation behind uh, writing this? Yeah, good. But I don't know how much we need a guide to reading the Book of Mormon, but this is a guide to the field. It's an introduction and a guide to Book of Mormon studies. Part of what motivates that really straightforwardly is that there are a ton of things written, lots of different journals and conferences and uh, books and publishers and events, and it's very difficult for someone first sort of getting interested in scholarly work on the Book of Mormon to know where to turn. Uh, for some people, that might be a question of what's safe, right? Um, for others, it might just be what's valuable. Uh, and so what we tried to do here is um, lay that all out, and for someone interested in really digging in in a more scholarly way to the Book of Mormon, Here's a way of kind of finding your way around the field. And one of the statements you make right in the introduction, um, it says, in fact, we may be at the beginning of a golden age of Book of Mormon scholarship, but the good work that's going on isn't reaching most Latter-day Saints. Can you explain wh why you think we're at the beginning of the golden age and why you think a lot of Latter-day Saints aren't aware of what's happening right now. I, I would say we're at the beginning of a golden age, in part because we're just seeing a massive proliferation, uh, just a lot of people working on the Book of Mormon, uh, and I would say more than we've ever seen, and in particular, a much wider variety of approaches, different styles, different interests, different questions, different methods, uh, in a way that we've never seen before. Uh, when we've had sort of explosions of Book of Mormon studies, there was one in the 80s and the 90s, for instance, uh, but it was uh, largely sort of monolithic, one approach, uh, one kind of style of study uh, that's really dominating, which did a lot of incredible work. Uh, but what we're seeing right now is a much more diverse, much more varied kind of field um, and a lot happening new publication opportunities, new conferences, and uh, a lot of interest. So I think uh, I think we're starting to see something kind of new and big happen there. Despite that fact, <laughs> um, it's hard for this stuff to get all the way out to the, the sort of interested Latter-day Saints, um, in part because these are scholarly endeavors and they kind of get ensconced in academic contexts and so on. But part of it is just that um, academic things don't tend to get uh, social media play and things like this, right? So it's much easier to find some YouTube videos or uh, a podcast or something like that than it is to find what's going on in the scholarly world. So what what would you suggest to the interested amateur here? Where 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 to start? What we do in the book is in part we just sort of lay out the field and say here's what it looks like and here's what's going on, but we include at the back of the book several appendices. Mm -hmm. And for my money, this is the real value of the book for many readers. I think uh, a few appendices where we just say how to get started, what does it look like, what books do you have to read, must you have on your shelf, must you go back to, what books might you dig into if you're interested in this or that or the other, um, where are the conferences, what are the publication venues, what are the online resources. So the appendices, which I don't remember how many pages, but I mean, 20, 30 pages of an appendix mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that just says, here are all the places you can get started. Um, so if anyone were to ask me how to get started, I would I would simply say, yeah, flip straight to the appendix and start digging around. And, and one interesting thing is, is um, I think even I thought of Book of Mormon scholarship as largely a field of apologetics. Mm -hmm. You deal with apologetics in the book. Um, but you also note that's one area of study. Here's a bunch of different areas that a person could go off into. So what are some areas outside of just defending the Book of Mormon that could be interesting for people to study? Yeah. And maybe I'll say just a word about the, sort of the historical backdrop there, right? In the 20th century, it really was 99% apologetics, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. most of what Book of Mormon scholarship was. And for good reasons. We felt under attack a lot, right? The Book of Mormon was often questioned. So uh, so there's a reason that that was so dominant. And I think as a result, we still tend, or at least at the sort of average everyday level, we tend to assume that's what Book of Mormon scholarship is. But yeah, lots of other things going on. Uh, a couple of really dominant emergent uh, 
things going on. We have a lot of theologians working on the Book of Mormon asking, what does the book say? How does it say it? If we were to ask what we usually call doctrinal questions of the Book of Mormon, how does it respond? Um, how does it understand, uh, say, how does Lehi understand the atonement of Jesus Christ over against how does Benjamin understand the atonement of Jesus Christ? And how do we think about slight differences or tensions between these or something? Um, or what can we do theologically with the Book of Mormon? If we read this passage, how can it give us to do theology better? So there's a lot of that work, in going, work going on. There's a great analogy in the book about the Book of Mormon being a car that's <laughs> kept in a garage. Can you explain that to us and, and just what you mean by it? Yeah, this is at the end of the book. We, um, we compare the Book of Mormon to a car that uh, when we're doing only apologetics, it can feel like we've got a car in the garage, it's a Ferrari or something, right? And yet what we do is go out into the garage and we turn it on and go, does it run? Yeah, it runs. We turn it back off and then go back in the house. Whereas doing something like theology, at least for my money, right? I'm a theologian, <laughs> uh, is uh, taking the opportunity to turn the car on and then take it out and drive around, see what the Book of Mormon can do. Um, it's really, really important, both for the purposes of our faith and for the purposes of, um, uh, of, of simply understanding what the restoration amounts to, to have a defense of the Book of Mormon. There's no question. But if that's all we've got, then we've defended something we don't have any content in, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so theology is one of these fields that's getting at that. And there's an interesting quote in the book that I'm going to paraphrase. Um, I can't remember who it is, but they said something like, as an adult, I was afraid to read the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. Not because I wouldn't think it was true, but because I thought it might not measure up uh, yeah. to my adult testimony. I was afraid it would be uh, too juvenile. And you yeah. guys are saying, no, it does measure up to those things. There's interesting ways to explore it. I think that's absolutely the case, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a passage, I don't know if this is the one you're alluding to, but there's a passage in Hugh Nibley's writings where he says, you know, when I was a kid... Uh, we all read the Book of Mormon in the church, and he's, you know, he's talking about the 1930s. Uh, but when I was a kid, we, we read the Book of Mormon, we all thought, what is this talking about? A world that's falling apart and complex politics. And, well, this has nothing to do with anything, right? <laughs> but it's only when he then kind of grows up and really comes back to the book that he's like, my heavens, this book has real heft and weight. And it's maybe worth mentioning just kind of going back to the question you asked a moment ago, if you watch just the trajectory of Hugh Nibley's own career, for 20 years, he's working to develop defenses of the Book of Mormon's antiquity, it's being an ancient book. Mm -hmm. And then he spends 20 years reading the book. Mm -hmm. So everything he does in the 70s, the 80s, into the 90s, uh, he's not looking for proofs anymore. He sort of feels like he's done that, right? And now what he's doing is saying, what does this say right here, right now? It has content and it's pushing hard. Right? Yeah. He has this trajectory where now that he knows the book's historically defensible, uh, let's see what the book actually says. What does it say about poverty, consecration, uh, politics, all these interesting areas where the Book of Mormon comments in surprisingly sophisticated ways. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, give us a, an overview of the book. The book's relatively short, five chapters, yeah. um, and each chapter carries a lot of material with it. Like you said, this is an introduction, but it's astounding as to how much ground you cover in a short period of time. So give us a, a kind of bird's eye view of what the book covers. Sure. Uh, I mean, it opens with an introduction like any book would, but then uh, we dive right in. Uh, there's a first chapter uh, that is looking back. And what we're trying to do there is just say, what did Book of Mormon studies look like before the 21st century? Mm -hmm. uh, so we look at its sort of uh, first stirrings with Orson Pratt, late 19th century, and then how it develops through figures like Nibley, but also Sidney Sperry and Wells Jakeman, and then the explosion of interest in the 80s and 90s with the Farms Project, the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, uh, with John Welch and John Sorensen and so on, uh, as well as some sort of first stirrings of literary approaches, which have become very dominant recently, right, mm -hmm. alongside theology. Uh, so that's what we do in the first chapter. The second chapter, then, we just try to take the basic survey of the field. What's the field look like? What's going on? And we do that in terms of uh, a series of uh, different disciplines. Okay, so here's like literary angles on this. Here's what theology looks like, right? Here's uh, looking at the historical origins of the Book of Mormon, et cetera, et cetera, right? Intertextuality. Uh, so we just try to lay out here's, here's kind of what's going on, generally speaking. In the third chapter, uh, we sort of back up a step or two and talk about some of the obstacles 
facing the field of Book of Mormon studies. And part of this is just a kind of carryover from the very deep need we have to defend the book mm -hmm. against its detractors. Uh, but as a result, it can be a kind of politically complicated field in the 21st century. And because part of the reason we wrote this book was to appeal to young Latter-day Saints and say, hey, come join, come work. We want, we want people working on this book. Uh, we wanted to make sure we sort of make clear how politically complex the field can be and to call for getting along, right? <laughs> Basically, give everyone some space. We need to work on this book together and give each other the benefit of the doubt as we do. Mm -hmm. A fourth chapter, uh, we deal with uh, common questions, questions people tend to have that they struggle with as they read the Book of Mormon. So these are sort of traditional questions, if you will. Uh, how do I make sense of um, things that look anachronistic? It talks about horse bones and how do I deal with that? Or uh, how do I think about, say, the translation process, the presence of King James language in the Book of Mormon, um, and so on. So there we just kind of say, here are the common questions people tend to have. And here's how scholars dealt with this in the 20th century. And here's kind of how those are shifting slightly in the new context of Book of Mormon studies. Finally, a fifth chapter um, where we look at where the Book of Mormon, the field of Book of Mormon studies has gone in the last 20 years. Like what's changing? What are the new questions on the table? And how are they being addressed? And here especially, we focus on, say, questions of race, questions of gender, questions of violence. Uh, these are the kinds of questions that, while they received some attention in the 20th century, are receiving a great deal of attention right now. And in large part because it's what keeps young readers of the Book of Mormon up at night, right? Mm -hmm. They struggle with these questions. And so these are the kinds of things that Book of Mormon scholars are trying to think about now. And one thing that surprised me was in, in the in the chapter on obstacles, I was expecting kind of the anachronisms, the Isaiah issue in the Book of Mormon. But you point out, um, you and your co-authors, that one of the biggest issues, obstacles, is apathy. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of a general, why would this book be relevant to me? Why should I study it? How would you address that question to a young person? Yeah. I mean, I think this really is a concern. I mean, so I'm a, I teach Book of Mormon here at BYU. That's my daily bread, right? And, uh, and I think that is literally the biggest challenge I see. There are certainly students who are struggling with the questions I just mentioned, race and gender and so on. Mm -hmm. And there are questions here or there that students have where they're like, I don't know how to make sense of this issue historically in the Book of Mormon, but the vast majority of them come into my class, especially if they've been on a mission or something, saying, look, I've read the book a dozen times. I know what it says. I know the stories. There's nothing else to learn here. There's just a kind of boredom with the book. Um, we revel in the fact that the Book of Mormon is relatively plain by comparison with, say, Paul or Isaiah, right? Mm -hmm. But also, like, that means that we get bored with it at some point, right? We start to go, oh, maybe there's not much more to this book. And so, yeah, this is one of the challenges. And one of the things Book of Mormon studies really can do is say, you know what? You have just scratched the surface. This book is so much richer and deeper. For my money there, the two fields that are doing a lot of really important work, theology again, mm -hmm. theology is saying, why does this book matter? What is its message? How does it, how does it land, right? But also then literary work, right? This is the other really major recent developments is all this literary work on the Book of Mormon, which is showing uh, really just how rich and deep the book is. Not necessarily its immediate relevance, though that can grow right out of literary readings, mm -hmm. but just showing that the book is way more complex, way more intense. It's got interesting things going on that you just don't see until you use a couple of literary tools to, to dig in. One of the chapters when we talked preliminarily here that you wanted to focus on was chapter five, which is yeah. new directions. Mm -hmm. This is where you introduce us to what does the book want to say about politics? What does it say about race? What does it say about gender? These are all questions that receive so much attention in our time. So uh, give us kind of an introduction to how you would approach those and, and some new things we could draw from the book. Yeah. I think this is particularly important. The, um, I mean, this really is the challenge right now, I think. Uh, some years ago, obviously some years ago, since he passed away some years ago, uh, Elder Maxwell said that he wanted no uncontested slam dunks against the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. And this is something that defenders of the Book of Mormon have used to say, look, we have to defend this book. We've got this apostolic uh, commendation to do this. Um, what strikes me is that in the 21st century, the slam dunks against the Book of Mormon tend to be about things like race and gender mm -hmm. and violence and this kind of thing. People tend to say something like, look, the book is just so obviously racist, 
why should I deal with this at all? Mm-hmm. Uh, it is so there, there are no women here. Why should I give myself to a book that just can't speak to the 21st century and so on? So this is part of the reason I think this work is particularly important. We have to be able to show not just that the Book of Mormon has ways of like there are ways of answering that concern, but that the Book of Mormon is actually really rich and deep and relevant on these questions. So part of what's so exciting about recent Book of Mormon studies, I think, is that uh, people who have worked on the question of race or worked on the question of gender or violence or politics uh, have begun to show that the book is actually, in fact, uh, much more surprising than anyone would guess. Mm -hmm. If you dig into the question of how women appear in the book, for instance, there are patterns rather than just a kind of, oh, lack, right? Mm -hmm. It turns out, oh, in Lamanite culture, there's something more like gender parity, whereas among the Nephites, there seems to be a problem. And you've got this one prophet very early in the book, Jacob, condemning Nephite culture for what's happening to women and saying things like, because you don't keep these commandments, you will be destroyed. And because the Lamanites are keeping commandments regarding gender relations, they will be preserved. It may be that the whole book is not just lacking women. Oh, that's bad. It's lacking women in a way that's supposed to show us the disaster that happens when a culture gets this wrong. So that kind of a reading is, I think, for me at least, very exciting because it's not just that we can go, well, the book is ancient and women didn't fare well in the ancient world, so don't worry. We can actually say the book is speaking right to our situation. It is for our day, even on questions of gender or race or what have you. Yeah, it's interesting to say that rather than calling the book sexist, we can look at it and say, is it a critique of sexism? Exactly. Rather than calling the book racist, is it a critique of racism? Mm -hmm. Um, those are all interesting directions to take it in. Um, let's, I, I'm, and I want to explore this further. Like, uh, probably the most common concern that comes up among my students is, is the book racist? Mm-hmm. And it seems like there's the simplified narrative of the Nephites are the good guys and the Lamanites are the bad guys, mm-hmm. which you've already addressed. That really isn't there when you start looking at it. Absolutely. Um, how would you address a person's concerns that says the book? The book is racist. Yeah. I mean, there's really important work, and I'm not a scholar of race very directly. I've written only a little bit about this and so on, but there are other people saying saying really interesting things, so I'll mostly summarize their work, right? <laughs> um, and, and it's worth saying this problem really is apparent to people. Um, I was at a conference just a few weeks ago, uh, and a friend of mine there who's not a Latter-day Saint, never been a Latter-day Saint, uh, and is a professor of English, um, but she works on the Book of Mormon. Uh, And she said in passing that whenever she's at academic conferences and mentions the Book of Mormon and says, you know, I want more people studying this book, and she's studying it as a literary artifact, but still, she says the common response from scholars out there who have nothing to do with our tradition is just, well, the book's racist, why? Like, it's just that plain, right, Mm -hmm. (laughs) to them. So this is a really, I think, important question to be able to address. So what I would say to someone asking that question is twofold. So first I would say we have got it fundamentally wrong if we think the Nephites are the good guys. It's not just that that doesn't quite get borne out. Like we are missing the whole point. Mm -hmm. The very title page of the Book of Mormon says that the point of the book is to show something to Lamanites about what God has done with their fathers and mothers, right? So we've got something here that has to be, uh, the whole book has to be a story about Lamanite redemption and promise and, uh, and covenant. And if we read, say, Mormon's project with that question in mind, then I think actually it's really quite clear what's going on. The book of Mosiah introduces this new church on the border among the Lamanites. The book of Alma tells a story about how that church has its first successes among the Lamanites. Uh, Then the book of Helaman shows a complete reversal where the Nephites are falling apart, but the whole Lamanite nation is converted, and then Christ shows up. And the story that Mormon is telling you then is a story of Lamanite redemption. This is a story about Lamanites being claimed by God. So when we read it as, oh, these Lamanites are horrible people who just constantly cause problems for the Nephites, we're reading it in a racist way, I think, right? And so it may be our own sort of uh, implicit biases that are creating a certain racial picture in the book. Um, there are passages that are very hard to make sense of nonetheless. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's that's something that students, uh, I find, really wrestle with. Uh, But I think one way to come at that uh, is that what we find in the Book of Mormon is not simple patterns of racially problematic language. What we find is figures who are wrestling with that, right? So take um, Nephi, for example. Nephi has passages in 2 Nephi 5 that sound really, they're hard for us to know what 
uh, how to make sense of them in the 21st century. But he's also the prophet who quotes God saying that, that he denies none that come unto him black and white. So we've got a prophet wrestling with his own sort of inherited culture mm. that has racializing and even racist tendencies that he's uh, sort of there in, right, born into. And we've got him hearing God really clearly and trying to struggle against this. Uh, and that feels to me like something that's deeply relevant in the 21st century, rather than I don't want to read about figures who just are already beyond the problem and never get anything wrong. I want to read about figures who are struggling to get over their own biases and uh, can hear God saying really clearly that they should. That's my situation, right? Mm -hmm. So the book can actually teach me something. Yeah, it was interesting in a conversation for Why Religion I had with Jan Martin a couple months ago, the story of Samuel the Lamanite, mm -hmm. uh, which on the surface is like, here's an exceptional Lamanite. He's different than everybody else. The way Jan reframed it was, no, Samuel was not the exception. It seems like he was representative and he's critiquing the Nephites for their racism. The, the Nephites aren't the good guys here. And here's a an indigenous person speaking to them and saying, you're going to have to pay a price unless you repent. Yeah, and I think it's marvelous that Mormon tells this whole story, right, from Mosiah through Helaman, and the last voice we get is Samuel's. That's the last prophetic voice we get before we get Christ, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Let me um, let me uh, bring up another new direction, too, which is, uh, what does the Book of Mormon have to say about violence and warfare? Um, I think growing up, uh, the person... A lot of young men identify with is Captain Moroni, uh -huh. how awesome he is. And I remember, you know, the picture in my room of Arnold Freeberg and Moroni with all the swords around him. And it does sort of come across as this, as an adult militant image. Yeah. But one of the most interesting things happening with the book right now is, is people critiquing it as a document preaching peace, preaching yeah. nonviolence. Uh, share with us a little bit about that direction. And here, I mean, I'll just mention a book that's very worth reading, Proclaim Peace by David Pulsifer and Patrick Mason that was published just, what, last year, I think, by the Neil A. Maxwell Institute. It's a really fabulous book. And they do a, I mean, it's about a kind of general theology of nonviolence, but they have these marvelous readings of the Book of Mormon along the way. Um, but yeah, people have begun to show that the book is much more complicated on the score than has been assumed. Um Especially, I mean, uh, it's a book that opens with violence and was apparently originally intended to close with violence, right? Moroni tells us he didn't expect to write the Book of Moroni, and that means the Book of Mormon would have literally opened and closed with beheadings, right? <laughs> but, uh, it can feel like a very violent book. Um, but yeah, there are ways to read it. Nephi, the way Nephi struggles uh, with the spirit in First Nephi 4 is actually a much more complicated story than it looks on its surface. Um, he doesn't immediately go, oh, God said this, that's okay, let's just do this. It's a much more complicated thing. Uh, we've got uh, readings that uh, of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's and the, the position of that. Chris Thomas has pointed out that if you take a, an 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon and literally just lay down first and last pages, then second to last and second pages, and so on until you get to literal, the very literal center of the book, it's the story of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's, mm -hmm. which he says is not accidental. If you take the Book of Alma and read it structurally, there's work on the structure of the Book of Alma. Uh, Mormon has structured the book so that the story of the preaching of the sons of Mosiah is set in parallel with the story of the war chapters. So that there's a kind of exploration here of preaching that leads to peace and preaching that leads to war. Two Nephite missionaries who go and preach peace and then two Nephite quote unquote missionaries, uh, Amalekai and Amaron, who go and create war. Uh, so that the book is exploring what our words can do uh, to provoke peace or to provoke war. So it's a much more nuanced book on that score than we often have thought. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place for you to check out. I want to draw your attention to a new book that the RSC has recently published called Pushing and Pulling to Zion, The Eighth Handcart Company Trek, Day by Day in 1859, edited by BYU's Reed L. Nielsen. 
While much attention has been given to the ill-fated Martin and Willie handcart companies, few books have examined other handcart companies traveling to the Utah Territory. This volume follows the members of one handcart company by sail, rail, and trail, all the way from their New York port to their destination in Salt Lake City. Primary sources from diaries and journals help to tell a compelling story, providing readers with a multifaceted perspective of lived religion on the Mormon trail and strengthening faith through the story of this company's pushing and pulling to Zion. Again, the book is called Pushing and Pulling to Zion, the eighth handcart company trek day by day in 1859. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Professor Joseph Spencer discuss his and his colleagues' recent book publication, Book of Mormon Studies, An Introduction and Guide. In part two of Our Religion, as you know, we like to explore a little bit more why this research matters. How can it inform us in helping to live, love, or learn aspects of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ? So in this part, Professor Spencer talks about how we can join with others, including non-believers, in conversations about the Book of Mormon, providing, by the way, a great analogy for it. He also discusses different and influential books on the Book of Mormon that people should read. Now, I want to bring up another analogy in the book, uh, because one thing that sometimes I think alarms people when it comes to new approaches to the Book of Mormon is this uh, feeling that we're, we're not just speaking on behalf of its historicity and we might be bringing in outside people like you mentioned uh, a friend of yours who's not a latter-day saint but enjoys studying the book of mormon um how would why why should we not be afraid to engage with other people who might not be believers in the historicity of the book but see value in the text yeah this is a uh, this is tricky ground and this is one of the reasons we have kind of politically complicated field, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is that some people can feel like it's um, inappropriate um, to read the book with people who don't grant its historicity or who don't grant its divinity even, right? Um, and I can feel those pressures myself. I mean, I'll, I'll be at a conference and hear a paper and I can twinge a little and squirm in my seat <laughs> and certain things are said um, because I hold this book to be scripture and I believe it's ancient and uh, that can be a little complicated for me as a believer. That said, um, there is an amazing uh, there's an amazing development going on with these uh, with scholars who are interested in the book for their own reasons, but they're showing Latter Day Saints how to read the book well. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I think this is a really important development. At the end of the at the end of our book, we use this image of the transcontinental railroad. So, 1869. The railroad that crosses the American continent is completed, uh, and right here in Utah, right, the Golden Spike. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a really intensely difficult time for Latter Day Saints. They had been at a long distance from the rest of America. They had been sort of free to be themselves uh, and develop their society as they wished, with their own economy and their own culture and all these kinds of things. Uh, and this meant suddenly that there was no distance with the rest of the country. Uh, and Brigham Young is making all kinds of moves. How do we prepare this and this and so on so that we know how to deal with the influx of, quote unquote, the Gentiles, right? Um, but it turned out in the long run that this opened up all kinds of space. And it was something that, regardless of whether we wanted it, we had to deal with it. And it turns out there were really important results. Um, and I think uh, I think something like that is going on in Book of Mormon studies. This is what we suggest at the end of the book anyway. Uh, the Book of Mormon is being taken seriously by mm -hmm. scholars outside our tradition. So we can hide in the desert, so to speak, right, and pretend that's not going on, or we can go out and meet them, see what they're saying, and be a part of that conversation. And at least for my money, it's worth doing that uh, so that um, we can uh, learn from them, but also share with them. And it's been really amazing to me. Uh, just as a scholar working in the field, to see how much goodwill there is. Um, there are certainly scholars out there who just want to say nasty things about the Book of Mormon or whatever, mm -hmm. but that doesn't seem to me like it's very honest scholarship when they do that, right? Mm -hmm. 
But it's been incredible to see how many scholars there are of goodwill who want to understand the book, want to make sense of what it's saying, how it operates, uh, and say really interesting things that I've learned a, a great deal from. Yeah, going back to your transcontinental railroad analogy, I think it was Brigham Young who would, they were, he was approached about the fears of what's going to happen when the railroad comes here, who said, it's a pretty poor church that can't stand <laughs> up to a single railroad. Right. And I, I think with the Book of Mormon, we have to say, this is a really robust book of scripture yeah. that bears examination, that it's okay if other people look at, and maybe we can learn from their approaches because they might not have the same framework that yeah. we have coming for us. Yeah, Hugh Nibley, at the, at the beginning of his book, Since Camorra, way back when, 50 years old now, um, but at the beginning of that book, he says, the Book of Mormon demands serious investigation. And then he says, the sad thing is that this isn't is it's not what it's received, right? We've just had this kind of trickle of quick denunciation without any real study. Uh, I think Nibley was right, and I think we ought to be celebrating the fact that it's getting real study. It does mean it's going to pinch, right? Uh -huh. They're going to draw conclusions on occasion that make believers um, squirm, but they're also going to see things we can't see mm -hmm. uh, just because of our own traditions and the ways we read things, and uh, and we will learn things. I've learned a ton. Just, just to point out uh, a sample, um, I had the chance to go to the uh, BOMSA conference, mm -hmm. just just one day of it, a couple of weeks ago in Logan, Utah. BOMSA stands for Book of Mormon Studies Association. Yep. And it was exactly what you described. There were moments when I felt really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and there were moments when I was, you know, cheering on for the person that was presenting. But I also came away with so many new insights mm -hmm. uh, from these different ways of looking at it. Tell us a little bit about BOMSA and yeah. BOMA and some of these great organizations that are promoting studies of the Book of Mormon. Yeah, and for anyone who wants to dig into these uh, more and see others, yeah, there's, again, the appendix in this book is all about that, right? Uh, but yeah, so the Book of Mormon Studies Association has been around about five years. Um, uh, its president is Chris Thomas, who's a Pentecostal, not a Latter-day Saint. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm one of the vice presidents, and so is Kim Matheson, uh, who's at the Maxwell Institute. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it throws an annual conference up at Utah State University and uh, just gathers scholars who want to talk about the Book of Mormon. We get scholars from inside the church. Uh, we get scholars who have absolutely nothing to do with the Latter-day Saint faith tradition, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get scholars who are working from other branches of the Restoration, right? Mm -hmm. We've worked very hard to get people from Community of Christ or from uh, the Church of Christ Monongahela or from um, the Joint Council of Restoration Branches and so on. And it's been a really marvelous thing to see what it looks like to have different traditions um, talking together about the Book of Mormon as well. Uh, it's a really lovely event, but yeah, it's a, but it's got a variety of perspectives very much. <laughs> it's the case, uh, here in house, we have the book of Mormon Academy, meaning in house in religious education at BYU. Mm -hmm. Uh, so these are all professors in the department of ancient scripture who about every year and a half, two years put out a collection of essays on some subject in the book of Mormon. I think there are four in print and a fifth one coming, or are there three in print and a fourth one coming? Uh, but these are, um, yeah, just, a, there's a volume just on Abinadi, right? And different takes on Abinadi. There's a volume we're working on right now just on the prophet Jacob, uh, different perspectives on Jacob. Um, the most recent one is on the Bible and the Book of Mormon, their relationship. Uh, so there's some exciting things going on there. And lots of other things, the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies exists. There's Book of Mormon Central online. There's uh, There are things like the Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon, published by the Maxwell Institute. There's lots of exciting opportunities and conferences and events and stuff going on. So I don't want to put you on the spot here, but um, you already said, ooh, this is a book I would definitely recommend. Are there two or three books you would say, hey, uh, take a look at these. They might not be that well known. Let, let's shine a little light on them because they're doing good work. Yeah. So there's uh, there are a few books that are absolute must reads for anyone really interested in Book of Mormon studies. No question. Uh, and these are not hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, and I would mention two there. One is Terrell Givens' By the Hand of Mormon, mm -hmm. uh, published in 2002. Um, and it's a kind of history of how people have talked about the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. uh, so it does a lot, a very little reading of the Book of Mormon, but it's talking about how people have made sense of the Book of Mormon. The other is Grant Hardy's Understanding the Book of Mormon, which was published in 2010. 
Uh, and these two books uh, together sort of form like the lingua franca of the field. Everyone knows these books. Everyone's responding to these books and so on. Grant Hardy's book is a, is a narratological reading of the Book of Mormon, which means he's looking at what is Nephi's sort of authorial voice look like? How is that different from Mormons? How is that different again from Moroni's? What are their projects? What are their styles? That kind of thing. Uh, and just very profound reading. Now, this is a very close reading of the Book of Mormon, where Givens's book is about the f shape of the conversation. This is a direct reading of the Book of Mormon, and just really, I mean, packed to the gills with insights that uh, no one had seen before. Um, beyond that, there's just lots of interesting things, right? <laughs> lots of interesting things going on in lots of different ways, and it's hard to know exactly what to point any one reader to. I, uh, I mean, I certainly think that the Brief Theological Introduction series is an important. Uh, important development. This is a 12 volume series, but each volume is very short mm -hmm. um, uh, about the Book of Mormon. And each volume is on a different part of the book. So a volume on first Nephi, a volume on second Nephi, a volume on Jacob, a volume on Enish, um, or Enish Jerem Omni, and so on. And a dream team of authors working on yeah, this. Yeah, really amazing Some people. Some really, really wonderful yeah, people. Yeah, from Terrell Givens to Adam Miller, from Rosalind Welch to Kylie Turley, uh, Mark Rathall, Jim Falconer. Uh, et cetera. It's really Kim Matheson. It's really an amazing series, I think. Um, if I had to mention any of my own, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's uh, this isn't coming out for a little while, but uh, the, wor the book I've been working on for 10 years is coming out next year. Uh, and it's called A Word in Season. Um, a Word in Season, the subtitle is uh, Isaiah's Reception in the Book of Mormon. And this is published with the University of Illinois Press. Mm. It'll be out next fall. Um, and I'm very proud of it. I'm very happy with it. But it's a study of Isaiah and the Book of Mormon and aimed at a non-Latter-day Saint scholarly audience, though aimed as much at Latter-day Saints as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's me trying to make sense of that very old question we've got of what is Isaiah doing in this book? But I'm trying to come at the question in a different way than has been done. Can you give us a brief preview? Sure. Yeah. What I'm trying to do in the book is ask how the Book of Mormon reads Isaiah rather than this. The traditional question we tend to ask is just, one, what the heck does this mean, right? Mm -hmm. And two, we tend to say something like, are the, like, the little changes you can find in the Book of Mormon's version of Isaiah, do they match up with any ancient documents and so on? Are we okay and sort of defending the Book of Mormon as as right to have Isaiah in it, or are there problems historically? These are the two questions we've tended to ask. What I'm doing instead is asking, so how, what does the Book of Mormon actually do with Isaiah? How does Nephi read Isaiah? How does Abinadi read Isaiah or Noah's priests? How does Christ read Isaiah? Um, and what I do then is not only try to riddle that out, but then I set that in conversation with the longer history of how people have read Isaiah. So when Abinadi reads Isaiah 53, does he read it in a way that's relatively traditional? Does it look like most Christians? Does it look different from most Christians? Uh, how would someone in, say, 1830, first picking up the Book of Mormon, respond to Abinadi's reading? Would they go, that's weird? Or would they say, oh, yeah, that makes sense? <laughs> so that's the question I'm asking all through it. Uh, wh what are they actually doing with the book, the book of Isaiah? And how weird or normal is it? If you're interested in Professor Spencer and his colleague's book, Book of Mormon Studies, An Introduction and Guide, published jointly by the Religious Studies Center and Deseret Book, we have provided a link to it in the episode notes and on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu. There, you can also learn more about Professor Joseph Spencer, his training, and his research and teaching interests. And if you've enjoyed this episode, I'd also recommend you listen to Professor Spencer's past two Why Religion episodes, episode 57 on Hugh Nibley's contributions to Book of Mormon studies, and episode 19 called Book of Mormon Theology. And the episode that was mentioned in their conversation about Samuel the Lamanite is episode number 54, Confronting Prejudice with Samuel the Lamanite with Professor Jan Martin. Okay, we have arrived at our last and final segment, part three, where we like to talk about things a little bit more personally with a professor. So since Dr. Spencer has already been on the podcast a few times and has explained his journey that led him to BYU, here he concludes by giving examples of how he approaches and teaches a text of the Book of Mormon and gives suggestions about how to study the Book of Mormon. Well, uh, Joe, for the last part of our conversation, um, we, we usually talk about you. 
And uh, since you've appeared on My Religion before and answered our questions about faith and reason, uh, we talked about you have a unique way of teaching the Book of Mormon. Um, I had a student this week in my class come up and say, I really like Brother Spencer's approach to teaching. I'm going to take a third class from him, <laughs> which is a good endorsement. And so I thought it might be helpful if you explain to us, when you're in a classroom and you're teaching this text, um, how do you do that? And how could that help a teacher out there who's going to be teaching a sacred text? Oh, I'm always nervous to say that my teaching is good for anyone else <laughs> <laughs> or helpful for another teacher. Yeah. But um, yeah, my approach to teaching is... Uh, it is a little unique. It's very common nowadays in university settings, whether teaching religion or anything else, mm -hmm. to, to do it by PowerPoint slide. Here's information, here's information, here's information, slide by slide, mm -hmm. and kind of talk through those and so on. Um, I don't use anything like PowerPoint slides. Uh, I have books open, and we sort it out sort of line by line. Uh, what do you think that means? How do we understand what that's doing? Let's construct that. You know, let's sort out Korahor's argument here for four verses, really understand step by step what he's actually saying. Now we can look at how Alma's responding to it. Let's look at that line by line and really try to unpack that and uh, and sort of map it out on the board as we go, rather than uh, having a kind of prepackaged idea, try to let the text teach us in the moment. So it's a bit more interactive with the text than I, than I think often happens in the classroom. Um, but it's also, as a result, like uh, the kinds of questions I'm asking of the text are, um, they're, they're questions of meaning rather than historical questions. They're questions of meaning rather than application questions most of the time, though we'll spend time on those other kinds of issues too. But for the most part, we're just asking, what is this saying? What is this saying? What is this saying? Uh, which can make for a very different kind of experience in the classroom, I think. It feels like... I'm sad to say this is almost a novel approach because, <laughs> you know, in, in the gospel doctrine class, sometimes it's, here's a video and here's another video and there's no time to sort of, here's the text, here's the words, let's, let's look at the words and see what they have to say and draw a meaning from it. Um, what kind of preparation uh, do you have going into that? Do you just open the book and explore alongside the students or do you go in with a set idea in mind? It depends on which class I'm teaching. Um, when I teach sequentially, it's much more sort of go in, open the book, and see what happens. There's some preparation, obviously. I write, I read, and I think, and I so on, but I don't have a prepared lecture, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm teaching something like, uh, we have a course called Teachings and Doctrines of the Book of Mormon, which is a bit more jumbled up. It's not sequential, mm -hmm. um, where we're trying to work through bigger ideas in the Book of Mormon. So there, I, I've obviously sort of shaped the class period a bit more than I would have otherwise, but I still try to build it around a chapter, or a couple of chapters and develop what's happening across those and let it unfold sort of organically. Um, so yeah, I mean, I do prepare, obviously, right? I have, to, <laughs> I have to go in with something to say, but I really do want to, whatever is going to happen to come out of the text rather than out of me. Yeah. Um, so There's a virtue to not being over-prepared where yeah. say every single thing you're going to say is on a PowerPoint. Right. Uh, and that, that, I mean, Bless your heart if you're a teacher and you're prepared to begin with. Uh, but sometimes there's a little bit of virtue in not having everything be scripted and allow the spirit to move on the students. Yeah, and I mean, I will say uh, there's probably less discussion in my classroom than there is in some classes, right? I think some teachers uh, like to open a discussion question and really get the students talking. And I, I am a little less inclined to do that as thoroughly or as for as long or something like that. But I do feel like I learn constantly from my students because... Uh, and I tell them this very straightforwardly in the class. I'll say, look, we're all idiots when it comes to the Book of Mormon. Like, we, who here has figured it out, right? So raise your hand, say something, right? Interrupt me. Let's figure this out together. And it is, I mean, not a class period goes by that someone doesn't say something that catches me off guard, makes me see something in the text, and opens up real possibilities. Mm. Makes me think of a, a quote you guys highlighted in the book. All four of the authors uh, write, it's our witness that the and testimony of the Book of Mormon is true, historically and theologically. It's a book that doesn't need to be handled delicately or kept on the shelf. It needs, rather, to be studied. Yeah. Uh, so, suggestions to study uh, oh. as you open up the book. Slow down. Just slow down. It's so easy to move too fast. 
Um, there's a marvelous little book by Jim Falconer, James Falconer, uh, called The Book of Mormon Made Harder, uh-huh. which I absolutely love. Uh, I love the provocation of the title, <laughs> and I love, I love what he's doing. It is 400 pages or so of nothing but questions. Mm-hmm. Like He answers none of the questions himself. Uh, he just says, what about this? What do you think that means? How do you make sense of that? And that seems to me to get at what it means to study the Book of Mormon, whether you like Falconer's questions in particular or not. But we just move so fast. Uh, we think the point here is just to get the basic idea and then apply. But uh, but I suspect that we've got to do a lot more digging first. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, uh, I'll mention uh, something I've shared with my students recently that I... I was kind of surprised to find. I was looking at, of course, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about building your house on sand versus stone, right? Uh, And we always, I think, read that very quickly and kind of move on. Uh, But when Jesus gives the same little parable in Luke, there's a bit more clarity or specificity to it. In Matthew, you might get the impression that one person just knows you're supposed to build on a rock and the other idiot just, (laughs) just thinks you build on sand. But in Luke, the contrast is between someone who digs down deep enough to hit the rock versus the person who just builds on the surface. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different picture. And it strikes me as a good way of thinking about what it is to study. If we just take a surface reading and then start applying it to our lives, we are on very shaky ground. And when floods come, our readings of the scriptures will not be enough to sustain us. But if we actually dig down deep enough that we hit rock, right? We get down deep enough that now we've got something really solid. I know what Nephi is saying in this chapter. Uh, Now when I apply it, I can build something on it that will stand. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, Professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, Ryan Sharp, and Hank Smith. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Alec Galloway. Say hi, Alec. Hi, guys. Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.